Oh my god. Space aliens. Don't eat me! I have a wife and kids! Eat them! Silence! We are travelers from a certain nearby ringed planet whose name we'd prefer not to mention. The Ken's Laser. Welcome everyone to another episode of Occam's Laser. Today, let's not beat around the bush. Let's just dive straight in because there are some pressing issues at hand. Um, aliens, they're, are they real? Uh, they're or, coming for you. Yeah, are they coming for you? Are they going to come into your bedroom and kidnap you at night? Probably during the day. We'll have a <laughs> world-renowned expert uh, on the line later. Uh, Alex Jones to fill us in <laughs> on alien probe. But first, uh, Dulta, why should anyone give two fine fucks about Neptune? Um, because it's big and it's a planet. Yeah, actually, is it a planet? Yes. Yeah, so people... Uh, <laughs> I would most definitely say yes. So I give this talk in schools <clears throat> about the solar system, like a journey around the solar system kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And I learn loads about the solar system because I don't care about it usually. Yeah, so but, like, wow, look at all them facts that I never don't know. Yeah, because one fact about Neptune is, first that they're gas giants, right? So you can't walk on it and then people... I'd say people are amazed by that. Well, people are like, they're not planets and they're just balls of gas. Like you tricked us. Like astronomers have been lying to us. Yeah, that's a kind of a weird definition of a planet, though. But you can't land there. You can't plant a flag. Well, you could. Because... <laughs> you could float a flag. <laughs> the other fact that I often tell schools is, and it is true because I looked it up earlier today to confirm, <laughs> I didn't mind telling children, but I thought I'd better look this up before. I put know. it down in audio. Um, that it like rains uh, diamonds on like Neptune and... Jupiter and stuff other planets yeah because it's so the pressure so people are like we should go and get them but i mean <laughs> <laughs> i mean if it's turning stuff into diamonds at that depth what are you going to use to go get them <laughs> yeah exactly the cost of going <laughs> we'll have to make a diamond you satellite better off just digging up the entire world to find diamonds it'd be much cheaper well child i mean you can't get child slaves to get diamonds from uranus <laughs> you know you have to use actual pay people proper i mean yeah the yeah, diamonds anyway why are we talking about this okay yeah so there was um an article you sent me that said if we're gonna go to neptune and uranus we should mm-hmm. do it soon yeah we should why well i don't even like soon is kind of a loose term right we should just go yeah yeah um because soon in terms of like planning missions in uh, astrophysics usually means 20 to 30 years <laughs> yeah so it's a career because you could do your phd on a mission that like i've certainly known phd yeah. students who have done their project on a mission that's supposed to be launching by the time they start their phd and it just uh doesn't even happen by the time they graduate because things get delayed yeah and there's also like people who would like be postdocs like young career postdocs who would, like start a mission planning like you know be involved in its early phase planning and then you know they'd be old by the time it actually launches like it yeah, takes so long and then it blows up on the launch pad <laughs> and then you're like damn it i wasted my life <laughs> yeah although they usually make two for that reason but i also don't know if there's any other sort of career like that where it's so all in you know like it's it's such a commitment to it like obviously there's a lot of astrophysics where people just work with data and aren't involved in specific missions but if you were and it was all on the line for that one mission and then it all went wrong. Like, I don't think there's any other career like that. Unless you were, you know, building like CERN and then it just never worked. That would obviously have been a huge catastrophe. But uh... but at least building something, it will hopefully, like at least it should function. I mean, I think it's most depressing when you hear about particle physicists who like just back the wrong horse and put all their ideas into like something that this particle that didn't yeah that doesn't exist and they spend years and years trying to prove it yeah like theoretically yeah it's possible (laughs) yeah or like the ether or any of that kind of stuff there's definitely people who sunk many years into ether was a feral fuck up now i have to say (laughs) feral (laughs) fucking bullshit (laughs) um but in the next few years if we send something to um uranus or neptune we can use gravity assist from jupiter Mm-hmm. And we can get there faster. 
So why didn't Voyager do that, or did it? So the, um, I think Voyager two did. Okay. Yeah. But the and because that's going faster, isn't it? And Voyager, I don't know. That's, yeah, that's very specific. Twenty two thousand miles. No, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but the yeah, all just the planets have to be in a certain alignment. So it's kind yeah. of uh, is it just a timing issue then? Yeah, it's weird that scientists now are like, oh, if we want to go, we have to go now. The planets are lining up. Like, well, this is. I guess that's that's probably a big part of why. Yeah. They want to go to Uranus and Neptune now because like the planets just work out. In, yeah. In a but good let's just orientation. Hope the person in charge is a Gemini or whatever, and then they'll have their alignment. Yeah. yeah, and they can they'll fund the mission and also find true love. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah, it's mad that like we haven't been back to those planets since Voyager two. It's been like thirty years. Yeah, so that was the first time. So all yeah, the, the pictures, only time. Yeah, all the pictures are like thirty years old and probably like not. Have you seen them? I can't remember. They're I'm sure on, I have. There's, there's like they're on the Wikipedia pages for them, and yeah, they're they're actually better than I expected, but still in like modern standards, pretty crap. Yeah. Um. But that I mean, like just having pretty pictures isn't the only reason you would go. Obviously, like there's so much like scientific value with actually going and seeing what they like what they look like now. Because in thirty years, there's probably a lot of stuff that changed. Like if you just have a snapshot, a snapshot of what they were like, you know, over the couple of days that you were like flying by them, it's kind of a bit of a biased sample, right? So like one of the biggest, um, or one of the most significant parts that came from it that time was like all of those high winds that they had. Like Neptune had the highest recorded winds in the like entire solar system. It was like fifteen hundred kilometers a second. Yeah, and so on Earth isn't. The fastest ever it was like two hundred or something. Two hundred fifty, yeah, something like kilometers that. an hour. Oh my units, yeah, possibly. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I can't remember now. <laughs> well, and there's a big difference. Anyway, they were both in the same units anyway. Yeah. So normalized. <laughs> well, on Earth, there's no way it was kilometers a second. Oh no, a second! I thought you said an hour. <laughs> no, it's definitely hour. But like miles per hour, or kilometers an hour. No, it's kilometers. Uh, well, we live in Europe, so yeah. Yeah. Um. Anyway, yeah, like that's extremely fast. And there was all those storms on it, just like Jupiter has the the great the great red spot. Yeah, it also has large storm systems like that, which would be interesting to follow up on. I made an embarrassing joke about the great red spot when I was in a school talking to like secondary school students who were all spotty. I was uh, like, "Here's something you're all familiar with: <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. the great red spot." But uh, yeah, those cringe. people. <laughs> Those people who were looking at Neptune and saw that big storm, yeah, the great spot. It wasn't red. It was, uh, <laughs> great Neptune spot. I think it's great dark or dark spot or something. Dark web. But when they looked at it with um, the Hubble, They're responsible. <laughs> the Hubble Space Telescope, it was gone, right? And so that's what you're saying. Yeah, it like was yeah. So it's transient, and you know it'd be interesting to go back and look at it up close and see why that is the case. Because like there's so much like fluid dynamics going on there. They also have magnetic fields, so like you know, a whole system very complex and changing. So yeah, I mean, sure, the Earth would look different every day from the sky. Yeah, I mean, even just looking at clouds. Yeah, amazing. And clouds are a big issue in like in exoplanet studies. So like, if you you know, we know now there's like what over four thousand exoplanets confirmed. <laughs> there you go. Like four thousand clouds. <laughs> <laughs> four thousand <laughs> cloud particles. Uh, no, 4,000 exoplanets and, you know, now, now we're moving towards trying to, like, quantify their atmospheres and stuff, so you're doing, like, transmission spectroscopy, so, like, looking through their atmosphere uh, with the, like, light from the star behind them and trying to look at, like, spectral lines and say, oh, well, this atmosphere has water, this one has carbon dioxide, this one has whatever, but if they have clouds, uh, like, opaque clouds in their atmosphere, it wipes out all of that information so, you know, studying outer planets like Neptune, which are like extremely cloudy, or Uranus, like they're all, like that would definitely help towards quantifying the same thing in uh, exoplanet systems, which would be good. Yeah, because most exoplanets discovered are quite similar to Neptune and stuff, aren't they? Yeah, there's they're... a large, well, so there's kind of biases here as well, which would also help in terms of like Neptune and Uranus are so far out. I think it would help us understand like exoplanets that also orbit their host stars quite far out. But uh, yeah, like I think the majority of um, exoplanets at the beginning definitely were all hot Jupiters because they were huge planets right beside the star, much easier to detect. And everyone was like, oh, 
we're like the earth is special it's nearly all hot Jupiters and then as like our instruments got more sensitive you're able yeah to obviously we're going to see the biggest things <laughs> first up, closest yeah. to the stars yeah and so like even now there's so like hot Jupiters are called that just because they're so close and they're like really hot uh, which makes sense and they're massive <clears throat> but for there's other things called like warm Neptunes so they're slightly less massive and slightly further out and so they're just like they're like Neptune size but they're a lot closer than Neptune is to the sun so they're just warmer um, but again like there could be loads of Neptune sized planets orbiting their stars like at a distance we wouldn't be able to detect a planet orbiting a star at the distance Neptune Neither. is orbiting yeah. the sun so oh really even that level I don't think so like, yeah. like maybe in a fluke scenario where yeah. it transits perfectly um, but like you know the radial velocity technique where they pull on each other that just doesn't really work at that distance yeah the difference is kind of insignificant but would you if you were in charge would you fund a, a mission to like neptune like I, I just you'd rather go to the moons of jupiter or saturn yeah, and stuff. like slightly more boring or something yeah like you could because they might actually find life down there like they can actually dig up the like oceans there and they're closer and we know a bit mm. more about them and stuff i think if it was up to me personally yeah i'd probably go to like moons of like saturn jupiter like enceladus and uh, europa which have like yeah those big underground like icy oceans and stuff because of the chance of maybe discovering like a bacteria there or something which would be monumental yeah which definitely would be out on neptune which would definitely get you a lovely nature paper <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly think of the citations so many yeah um but i do think yeah like they're kind of forgotten. I think it's like Jupiter is so much easier to study as in it's way closer. So much cheaper to get to. It takes less time to get to it. I don't know what's the light travel time delay between Neptune and Earth, but it's probably quite significant. Yeah, well, they said to get there, it will take like 10 years travel. Obviously not light travel, but just actually get a mission that far that it would take yeah, a decade like that's travel, so long is, like 10 yeah. years of your life waiting yeah. for a mission to get there yeah like you really want to start planning now and then it'll probably get there in like 40 years time if we by the time the mission is actually accepted. yeah and you don't want to find a problem like two years into the mission and you're like wait great we have to wait for eight years for it to although you've eight years to come up with a solution i guess yeah but yeah and even then like uh transmitting data back though is probably a pain like you probably have to wait like it's probably close to a week for the information to get back yeah, well, Earth and Sun is eight minutes. It's probably... But we're way closer to the Sun than yeah, we no, it's, it's so going to be yeah, much longer than that. We should have done the maths out. Do but the maths. It's probably 100, sol- it's probably 100 solar radii, right? Or something like that? No. Or not solar radii. Uh, yeah. <laughs> AU, I mean. AU. Um, I don't know. Oh, well, who will, who will ever know? Nobody. The answer is unknown. The limit does not exist. Anyway, yeah, we should definitely go to those planets anyway. Uh, but after we go to the Neptune. moon of Jupiter. So as we were saying, uh, <laughs> Neptune is 30 AU, 30 astronomical units. So it's only yeah. 30 times further down the Earth. So, yeah, that's not too bad then. Eight minutes times 30. Bad week. Unless <laughs> unless it's on the other side of the sun. Oh, yeah. then it's Well, then it's only that plus eight times minutes. two. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's pretty good, but it's the same bias was there for Mercury, right? We didn't go there for ages because people were just obsessed. Oh, with it's a tiny York. rock. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's far away and rocky. Burnt rock. <laughs> yeah, but Neptune is so dark and cold and, and Uranus and the rest. Yeah, I'm sure you could find people who are super interested, like, but yeah, I think there are more pressing places to go to first. Yeah. And then we can't even really go there because, like, the reason Mars captures so much attention is because, like, we could literally go there and build a, I don't know, we can walk on it, a forever. Starbucks or something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in terms of like sci-fi futures, like Neptune is the furthest significant planet. Obviously, Pluto is. <laughs> yeah, we haven't still maintained that Pluto is yeah. a planet, but um, yeah, it's not a planet anymore, so we immediately forget it exists. Uh, but like yeah, that would be a cool like base to have Neptune. Like it'll be the easiest to escape the solar system from. So, but then can you like that? You can't go there really. But you could have a you base orbiting. Out. Yeah, you right. could hang out. You could orbit. And they Neptune. have moons probably. Uh, like, yeah, it does have moons. It has loads. Like, yeah, fourteen or something, and Uranus is like twenty or something. 
Too many, if you ask me. Yeah, get rid of half of those. Not efficient. <laughs> yeah, they're also way smaller than like Titan and all those ones. And actually, one of like one thing that really annoyed me was uh, Neptune's moon is called Triton, and then there's Titan, which is a moon of Saturn, and then Uranus has uh, a moon called Tritium or something. <laughs> Very similar. Yeah. And like, pick different names. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's so many words. And they're just like, yeah, just stop getting all those tritons going. Yeah. yeah. Is Triton a god in, or something? Yeah. I know, I can stop bringing up questions. We have no idea what the answer is. <laughs> is, is a triton not a thing that you Oh, yeah, called? that's the thing that, they stab. The Neptune god yeah. would. Oh. His fork that he eats his dinner with. And <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Smites his enemies. <laughs> Neptune's two moons, Triton and Knife. <laughs> and Spoon. <laughs> yeah, but that's the standard classic. Thing. <laughs> so people, like, those missions, especially the ones for the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, fall under the, like, SETI umbrella. But mm-hmm. they cost so much. Like, if people were really interested in SETI, which they are, like, the cost of a mission would go a lot further by looking out in the space with telescopes um but then i guess you're not gonna dig up something i guess yeah so <clears throat> i guess though like you mean for seti to not remotely observe but to actually like be involved in well going if, there. if the sole idea of a mission was like okay that's look we have a billion life dollars yeah how do we find life i mean you could spend all of that just going to like I don't know a moon of Saturn and be mm-hmm. like oh there's nothing there or you could just really take over all the telescopes and look at all of the radio yeah like r- yeah remotely observe other exoplanets perhaps yes perhaps and tell me more <laughs> tell me more um we were going to talk about the Fermi paradox and that kind of stuff mm-hmm. but I was looking up Enrico Fermi uh, on Wikipedia <laughs> Very smart man. What a man. Very, very smart. Um, is that all you have to say about it? <laughs> <laughs> well, just that there was a, an, article, an article on Wikipedia. We do all the research on Wikipedia, it sounds like, because uh, you mentioned it earlier. Mm-hmm. But an article called List of Things Named After Enrico Fermi. Yeah. And it'd be quite a good game to try and guess them all. Now, obviously, we don't know that many. But yeah, I, did, like, I could call like the Fermi paradox. And isn't there like some sort of Fermi energy? Gamma ray space telescope. Uh, yes. And there's other mm-hmm. such things. But that's cool. I should have a Wikipedia page named after just things named after other people. Uh, we could make one, like a list of things named after Sean Mooney and just have a the blank moon. page. <laughs> the moon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just like looked it up here. So there's a lot. Yeah. Fermi arc, a phenomenon in superconductivity. <laughs> Fermi constant, which is. The strength of the Fermi interaction. Oh, a good one is Fermi problems. So he had he had this knack of. Um... There's way too much stuff named after him. I'm just scrolling through <laughs> yeah. here, like everything in physics. <laughs> but after, so he was involved in the Manhattan Project, and after the mm-hmm. bomb went off, that test, the big test, uh, Castle Bravo or something. Yeah. Um. And you stand there with uh, scraps of paper and then let them fall as the blast went past and he saw how far the paper blew Mm -hmm. out of his hand and then he could, like, from that infer, work back and have an estimate of how... The power of the bomb. blast, yeah. Like, you know, weeks before then they could actually figure it out. Um, But he always did shit like that. And there's a... a (laughs) A Drop of paper wherever he went. But there's a category of problems called, like, Fermi problems of, like, how do you... Get the energy just, of a bomb from paper. Or yeah, or, or they're just mad, like rough things. And the yeah. example question they gave is like, how many piano tuners are in Chicago? And then you kind of like just Estimate say, well, roughly, there's, yeah. Yeah. there's a piano in every 10 houses and a piano tuner can tune 100 <laughs> pianos in a week. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, But it's kind of good. They're, they're fun little things, although too yeah. hard to do. It kind of it reminds me of like there's the exam for like your undergrad they have like a problem based exam paper where you have to like logically think out what will be a reasonable value to accept here for like yeah like the number of piano tuners in a city or whatever I try 
figure it out but uh but people aren't built to do it i mean it's no very... it's like yeah especially when it's something you don't really haven't thought about before you can like completely miss yeah the piano way. tuners that's actually you can grasp that but if you said with no prior knowledge work out how many atoms do you think are in uh like a liter of water like you know like something once you get into the pure abstract it's incredibly mm-hmm. hard to think about i mean atoms in a liter of water should be okay <laughs> Yeah, but if you're you're even thinking of like if you just ask somebody that who doesn't know anything who hasn't like studied physics or chemistry, yeah, like you would be off by a factor of a trillion at least. Oh, at least, <laughs> yeah, like at least <laughs> they would have no they wouldn't even know how many atoms is like a lot or yeah, not be a like lot. a billion. Yeah, yeah, it's like actually it's like ten to the twenty four. Right? <laughs> yeah. Billion, 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 billion. Yeah. yeah, actually, to segue now into the Fermi paradox. Mm-hmm. Um, what's that? How all many about? billions of people do you think there are out there? Billions, yeah. Because the paradox is that there are, if you work statistically, there should be more or as many habitable planets in the universe as there are like grains of sand on Earth style numbers, mm-hmm. um, and people can figure that out. But it's you know, there's, yeah, there's lots of planets basically. Yeah, it's a hundred billion galaxies or stars in the Milky Way, hundred billion galaxies, which each have a hundred billion planets yeah, or stars. Big statistics here. <laughs> yeah. So even if one of them was advanced, mm-hmm. um, so for me, it's just like, what the fuck? Where is all the aliens? Where, where's the, my people at? <laughs> so where are they? Yeah, it doesn't really, uh, I mean, you had a good point, you know, I think, so there's obviously all these, um, theories of like great filters. Um, like all these civilizations hit some sort of filter that made them go extinct and usually it, they, they're they usually a consequence of either natural phenomena or uh, technological progression and like technological progression would immediately like prevent so if it was one of those reasons say like basically uh, a civilization uh, develops and then they all kill each other in nuclear war like obviously that would stop uh, civilization moving on to like spacefaring or ex- exploration right so I think that's probably the most likely answer or it's incredibly rare that intelligent life actually develops like way more rare than we think but that's good if that ends up being the answer because then we'll, we'll have passed the filter whereas something like nuclear war will still well there still that. could be a filter <laughs> we yeah. just won't know if it, it's there or not but, yeah uh, but like uh, Nick Bostrom, he's like a philosopher who writes about existential risk and stuff at Oxford, I think. But he said like one of the worst things that could ever happen to us is we find life on like bacterial life on Mars or something. Because then that just shows, oh, fuck, life isn't that rare, which means that there still must be some problem <laughs> ahead of us yeah, yeah. that we're still going to run into. So, yeah, I've never actually thought about it like that. Yeah, if there's like bacteria on Mars, intelligent life could develop and then probably wipe themselves out and that's why we don't see anything <laughs> yeah but there there are so many other um reasons that there couldn't be stuff i mean like i don't know if, say if you said okay on statistic on paper there should be like a, a billion civilizations there's mm-hmm. no way every one of them would all fall to something like nuclear war or like, because you always think that, geez, they're, even if there's one in a billion, you know, who just say, hey, we made it, we're just going to say hello. So there's a couple of things that always, like, kind of fascinate me about it, though, is, like, okay, so, yeah, I, we, we, again, like, it's one thing saying they're, like, civilized or intelligent, but we don't know how difficult it is to actually get to the point we're at. And even the point we're at, like, we have to specifically look at a planet and like, how are we going to say hello? We're going to send like radio signals and they're going to take, you know, whatever the distance is, like in light years, that many years to get there. And if we only spend like a couple of weeks beaming that signal at it, then they have to be looking during those few, like, you know what I mean? It's already, yeah. you're getting into like very unlikely chances that that planet has an intelligent civilization that's receiving radio signals and looking as well in those few weeks, like a few weeks is nothing on an evolutionary time scale. Yeah, so they're actually split up into two different types of um, approaches to SETI. So one is SETI where you're trying to detect signals from aliens. And we do that like all the time. There's these programs, um, which is actually why we're supposed to talk about this. Which but is I'll like, say it's arguably like, it's like better or easier to do to like keep looking 
Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's like having the satellite dish up listening. And then there's the METI, which is messaging extraterrestrials. And loads of people have said, we definitely shouldn't do this. We have no (laughs) idea what's out there. And it's so naive to just broadcast their place. And people like Stephen Hawking and Carl Sagan and loads of others were just said, it's a real stupid thing to do. Um, But I know, so Breakthrough Listen are like a, a fund from i think a guy called yuri miller he's like a, some russian tech yeah. guy yeah yeah so he's funding a billion dollars into these SETI expeditions and one of them is listening to stuff and the reason we're going to talk about this was because they released the results saying we listened to a thousand mm-hmm. stars and we didn't find yeah anything. it was something like 1300 stars they but there's published an, two papers there recently i think was it but there's another branch of that where they have um with uh he co-founded with like a breakthrough listen except it's not listen breakthrough something else yeah so Branch. breakthrough foundation is like the main like breakthrough is the name of the whole thing right yeah the organization yeah <clears throat> weird name but yeah Go on. but he and uh, himself and mark zuckerberg are like <clears throat> mm-hmm. making some drone or some stuff to send out into to the nearest stars like accelerating them to like 20 percent of the speed of light remember all that actually news? sending something yeah, they want like to send a, a swarm physical, of like, like probes, nanosats, or something. Yeah, yeah. There was like uh, what was it a year, two years ago when Stephen Hawking mentioned like, oh, we should be like just make a like a sail that you fire lasers at and propel through like radiative pressure, and then send like get and like have a tiny satellite that is very very small, so it's easier to accelerate, and then basically power it that way. And just keep firing lasers at it until it gets to like the nearest star. But that would definitely be a good idea. It would be very cool. It would t- still take ages to yeah. get there. But uh, and also when you do get there, you would have such minimal amount of time to like <laughs> take pictures <laughs> and like send them back. And then when you send them back, it would take the speed of light to get them back. Yeah. You know, so. And whatever it hits, it's gonna hit it pretty fast. Hard. If it hits anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Although actually, it might be too fast to even get caught in the gravitational. Like mm-hmm. pull up another star could just yeah shoot past it. Like, yeah, see. like it might get deflected, but yeah, at that yeah. point, like if you're accelerating it for you know forty years or something, it'll probably be going quite fast at that stage. Um. <clears throat> yeah, I had some points that I wanted to make, but we've kind of we've kind of we've kind of moved fast. <laughs> oh, move back. Um. Yeah, the whole like, uh, why we haven't detected civilizations. Um, I, I think it always like amazes me that like, we still don't know how people became intelligent or conscious at all in the sense that we're conscious compared to an animal like obviously animals are also conscious but like in a different sort of way yeah if there's a load of like dogs on a different exoplanet they're not going to be trying to <laughs> yeah so like we don't know how we kind of bridge that gap into being self-aware and to be looking for like other civilizations without knowing how frequent that mechanism is, whatever it is, like some random mutation or whatever made us like self-aware. It just seems weird to be like, oh yeah, well, there'll probably be civilizations that are self-aware and intelligent and doing things. And Yeah. But well, like that could be like a complete random chance that happens in one in a hundred trillion. And then if you've only got like a couple of hundred billion, then we're the one in a trillion, yeah. you know? But that's what it was for the dinosaurs, right? Because they were stable for millions of years like there was no yeah, like major yeah, years no major evolution or anything and then they got wiped out and that kind of kick-started mm-hmm. everything but like if not they'd probably still be around just eating grass or whatever yeah probably yeah because like they like the length that dinosaurs lived on earth is longer than they haven't since yeah, which yeah. is crazy yeah and um, yeah and like what's not to say that there's you know, billions of planets with just dinosaurs roaming around on them, but just they're not going to detect any radio signals, you know? Because the other big jump was probably from like prokaryotic to eukaryotic cells and like comp- getting complex life from crappy bacteria or mm-hmm. not so crappy. Mm. Good definition there. But the, the thing is, the sun is also relatively young, so if there's loads of other stars which are way older than us and we're looking at those like there's also the chance that we could like we missed could, people yeah but, or we could detect stuff from them but they're gone like they've been gone for like a million years you know and they've like it's yeah, i mean a million years would mean that it's a million light years away which would probably be oh, that's true too far away but yeah i mean 
But like we've only been yeah, we've only been sending like signals to space for like fifty years. Yeah. Which, which like is, that's such a minuscule yeah. amount of time. Um and the other thing is different types of stars with different masses live for different lengths of time. So the sun will live for about fourteen billion years or so, maybe a bit less. Um but if like you know, an M if there's a planet orbiting an M dwarf, it'll live for way longer. Or even like a smaller like the smallest mass stars will live for the longest out of any yeah. star. Yeah. So, you know, should we be looking around those stars in terms of planets orbiting those stars have the highest chance of, or the longest amount of time to develop? But then, I guess, you know, you run into issues because they're very dim stars, so they're kind of harder to observe. Um, but it's even, like, anthropomorphic or anthropocentric, I suppose, to think that, like, another... Just because we like to conquer shit and explore, mm -hmm. like, there's no reason to think another civilization would want to do that. Like, it's a real human thing to be like, let's go over there and kill those people and take and that land. Land, yeah. Ooh, more land. I can't wait. <laughs> yeah, it could just be some weird octopus, <laughs> like, or whatever, in space. Yeah. I remember actually seeing a Kurzasak YouTube video um, that in a nutshell channel. And they had, like, an interesting point as well, as if, like, if a planet was mainly liquid, you would have, like, a... Um, marine esque life. Mm, yeah. And like they could easily be it could be quite common that they're frozen in. So if the planet is too far away from the host star, the like top few kilometers of liquid could be frozen. And then you could have like this ocean, like a planetary ocean teeming with life. But it would never know anything outside of it because it would never be able to break through like the five kilometers of ice at the top. Yeah, it'd be like literally like if the sky was the ceiling, like and just yeah. this is And that could that could easily be happening, like. That could be very common. Yeah. Because there's so many planets that uh we've detected and so many that we haven't and probably orbit much further away. Because it's harder to detect them if they orbit further away. And if that's the case, they're probably very cold. But that that doesn't mean that life couldn't develop, you know, because like we evolved at our like temperature of our planet makes sense. Well, yeah. I'd say like other life couldn't move. But that's the reason that the moons of Jupiter and Saturn and stuff are so appealing. I mean, they're oceans under yeah. ice. Yeah. Because usually like planets will, when they form, will give geothermal heat. Right. Yeah. So that could keep any sort of, like say a water ocean liquid for like millions of years, which is more than enough time for life to develop. But even I think like Uranus or Neptune, like they get like a thousand times less light than the Earth from the sun but the winds are still caused by as you said the internal heat just cooling mm. down and from the earth like even some of the heat we have is, is like well obviously volcanoes i mean yeah stand beside volcano. a volcano and you're yeah like... yeah exactly that's just internal heat rating yeah like that's not from the sun at all yeah <laughs> if there was no sun would you just go live beside a volcano and try and but that's where life started i suppose wasn't it Bossa geothermal the... vents yeah. and stuff yeah the internal <clears throat> The other thing is, if there was a super advanced civilization, um, like even like Earth in a thousand years, if we weren't dead, <laughs> you would think AI, like it would be machine stuff, like it would be so non-biological, <clears throat> possibly. Yeah, you would imagine. Um, I mean, we should really just do an episode focused on like the future of AI. I know we talked about like AI and chess before, but we should yeah. do an episode just talking about AI. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, even, so yeah, AI should be super advanced and even to a point where, like, we just are, like... But as a condition, because if you're gonna, if we're gonna see someone coming from, like, a few light years away, they must have harness technology in some way, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's more likely it's some, like, probe with, like, that's running machines yeah. rather than any actual living beings or something like that. But something else that could be a reason why we don't see any other life is because of, uh, like, virtual reality. That whole idea of if uh, uh, society becomes advanced enough to create like realistic virtual realities that are infinite, then why not just live your whole life in that infinite yeah, reality? Yeah, thing. <laughs> yeah, that's entirely possible. So like we could be looking for, for other civilizations and they're not looking outwards, they're looking at their machines inwards, if that makes sense. And just living in their simulations. Yeah, in the perfect, <clears throat> perfect world. Yeah, in utopias essentially. <laughs> The other thing is like this is a very serious scientific inquiry like people spend their career on it but a lot of people 
regular folk, normies, if you will. <laughs> just lost all of our listeners. <laughs> those not in the ivory tower like us, um, you know, would think of aliens in the same bracket as like ghosts, aliens, mm-hmm. like kind of stuff like that. But mm-hmm. but people in, I mean, they like, can't really argue with the stats that there should be something else out there. It's funny, yeah, because you kind of have this weird gap where like you go into academia in like astrophysics and it's like people kind of uh, laugh is a strong word (laughs) but like people kind of you know think it's funny that you're yeah sneer at you for like studying any sort of extraterrestrial stuff because realistically we're very far away from actually either traveling to any of these places or detecting it well and we could detect one off on an off chance but yeah, no, but we've. I'd say but the you parameter also... space we've <laughs> observed has been like a fraction of a tiny oh, percent. Tiny, so yeah. it's uh, it's not likely. To yeah, exactly. Know. It would be complete chance. And then you have the other side of it, where it's like, yeah, the statistics say like one hundred percent there should be alien life, but it's kind of like people just kind of sneer at other academics if you're like spending your career looking for. That's what it kind of feels like. I don't know. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Yeah. Because like the talks, people are gonna go to them and like, we've been at a few. Uh, at conferences and different kind of talks that everyone goes to it's almost seen as more of a public talk than yeah. anything but it's not like they're like we have there's so the SETI Institute um you know 100 million quid at Berkeley one of the best universities in the world and they're really they have they use time on the best telescopes like mm-hmm. the best radio telescopes and I think they like the level of detection they can detect like radar that would be given off a commercial jet on earth from like five parsecs away so from like mm-hmm. whatever With multiple stars yeah, within that distance, 15 like. light years but i mean that's so far and it's such a faint signal that like they can it's detect. crazy that they can detect that yeah. Yeah. but so under actually what they released was they said the nearest whatever thousand stars didn't have any such signatures yeah we should say that yeah yeah so, i feel like it would be bigger news if there was yeah you would have heard and as you heard last week aliens were discovered i'm moving <laughs> on um but the see just that everything like fair okay so people are think why like why would we think aliens would even have radios and use radios and the analogy is that if you went into an office a modern office today but with a walkie-talkie so even technology from relatively recent and listen you think oh there's no one here we can't detect any mm-hmm. communication but mm-hmm. it's just not used and we wouldn't know what yeah. other civilizations would use but people are like well you know you might as well start somewhere with i think it's common though in terms of like you can pick radio up like we you know a lot of people consider radio as being like sound but it's a basic like wavelength of electromagnetic spectrum like it's a physical thing you know so it makes sense that we'd use it to communicate and as in you know like we can just detect those signals as waves and somebody else theoretically could too how to interpret them could be an issue (laughs) yeah because we're like they remove so i think th- like radio waves coming from black holes and stuff are real broadband gentle stuff and mm-hmm. anything man made <laughs> or human made is or well human made is really sharp like yeah like think of like bright. if you listen to your radio in your car it's at like a really specific frequency yeah and very loud um yeah. so that's what <laughs> the, your radio the kind down. of signals yeah they're looking for but like yeah who knows what people would use to communicate in you know, a thousand years. Smoke signals. Yeah. <laughs> but they can be shooting little atoms at each other. And... <laughs> yeah, I mean, like a Morse code through like... Through the gravitational yeah, The only thing is like, light makes sense because it's the limit of yeah. what we can travel. Yeah. One of my favourite light-based facts is that light, time doesn't exist for light. People just can't wrap their heads around that. It's excellent. It's so good. <laughs> oh, no. My favourite is that light has momentum or... Oh, like, the, like it has a pressure, like you. Yeah. Yeah. It has no mass, but it has pressure. That, yeah, that does freak me out a bit. <laughs> <laughs> and in time standstill. Yeah, it's good. They're good facts. Yeah, like when you tell somebody, like, oh, fire light over there, and it'll take like five million years to get there. But for the light, it's instantaneous. <laughs> oh, that is good when you phrase it like that. Yeah. yeah. And people are like, what? <laughs> yeah. And you're like, special relativity, bro. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's mad. Um, and. The other thing that actually I was going to open with, but I forgot, uh, so we will close with it. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> on time. What great planning. But that quote from who co-directed uh, There's No One Space Odyssey? 
Uh, J.J. Abrams. <laughs> <laughs> As J.J. Abrams said, uh, you know, there are two possibilities. We're either alone in the universe or we're not. And both are equally terrifying, which is true. No, yeah, it is very true. Uh, Arthur C. Clarke. Ah. But like, yeah, I think being alone in the universe is more terrifying. I don't think it's equal. I think it's more terrifying if we were the only people. Like, why us? <laughs> like, yeah, and there's so such much random mutation. Yeah, we have to like do a good job or whatever. Yeah, yeah there will be more pressure to, to carry on existing if we were the only... And also to be like more moral, right? Yeah. You want to just like... Yeah, if you're the only we're the adults, self-aware, yeah. intelligent beings we're the adults in the room basically <laughs> we have to yeah like you're the gardeners of the universe you want to yeah. make sure you got all that pruned and yeah kept in order you know yeah but there's loads of far off explanations for the fermi paradox we didn't talk about like that it's a we're in a zoo and you know intelligent life is leaving us alone until we get out oh, and yeah. stuff but like it's like it's, the us looking at ants aliens looking at us kind of yeah, so if mm-hmm. yeah, if you ask an ant next to a motorway, like, do you see the civilization around you? They'd be like, no, and we just don't even we can't even see past. Can't our, even comprehend it. Yeah. See past our nose. But if people wanted to dig into it, they could spend all day doing it. Yeah, I mean, I think we actually don't have enough time. But it, it is like the zoo idea is funny. Like they put us in like a playpen, like a section of a universe that just has like a yeah. boundary, and we're like, it keeps expanding. What's happening? Yeah. This universe is so confusing, and they're like, it's we're just in their little True simulated box stuff. or something like, yeah, like the Matrix. Maybe we're in the Matrix. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean that is legitimately a theory now with the whole like simulation theory. But yeah, who was a big opponent of that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, he shall not be named. Who's the head of that car company? Tom Ford. Space, space, space company. <laughs> Virgin Galactic. How long have no, um, Too long. People want to get on with their lives. All right. I mean, we should definitely thank our sponsors of the show. Yes. <laughs> Thanks to the... No. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to Lucy Burke for sponsoring this show. Yeah, thanks, Lucy. Whoever you are, random kind of donations. <laughs> random sponsors through Twitter that we get so many of. But yeah, I mean, um, thanks for listening, people. And, uh, you know, keep sending us those Twitter messages. I I enjoy them. Sean, you enjoy them. I read them all the time. I've read every single one we've got. <laughs> yeah. And that is a fact. Um. Yeah, go on and give us a listen and a um, like on Twitter. Um, yeah, five stars on Amazon or something or similar uh, iTunes, iTunes or yeah. whatever people are all these days. Do people rate things anymore? I know I don't. Yeah, we should rate it ourselves. <laughs> I'd rate us like a good three out of five. Yeah. <laughs> all right, that's good. All right, that's a wrap, folks. Oh.